So direct your attentions to the screen and you get those updates. Hey, what's up church? This is Steph Hines here to give you a few quick announcements. We are so excited because Kingdom Conference is coming up November 4th through November 8th. And we strategically placed this event to start the day after election to declare that no matter what happens, we are going to worship and put our trust in Jesus. And that's actually why we chose the slogan, Jesus is King 2020 for our shirt idea. So go pick up your merch in the lobby right after service today. And circling back, you'll notice that the first night of the conference is a worship and baptism night. And if you are interested in being baptized, you can actually sign up and do it then. Simply do this by texting baptism to the number on the screen. Now this one is for all you married and engaged couples out there. Marriage Encounter has been going on for the last couple Sunday nights. And if you've missed out, it is not too late for you to jump in. The next one is tonight at six. If you are interested or if you wanna come, go ahead and text marriage to the number on the screen or simply just stop by the connect area for more information. And lastly, we really just wanna keep it in front of you that the year end seat at the table offering is coming up on December 13th. Andrew talked to us last week about finishing out 2020 more thankful and faith-filled than ever. So let's do it. Well, this is Steph Hines keeping you in the know. Church, let's now welcome Andrew Znako to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Oh, there we go. Go ahead and take out your notes and your Bibles, because that's what we do in church. Man, it's good to see everybody. Gosh, seeing some faces I haven't seen in a while. It's like the best when you see a friend after a while, you know. It's awesome, especially when you get surprised, you're passing. You're like, hey, wait a second. Come here. All right, well, maybe it's just me that loves my friends. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Bibles and notes open up to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1 is uh, very near towards the end of the Bible if you're looking for it. And it's small, so it's easy to miss. It always gives me trouble. There's no shame in the table of contents. Come on, somebody. I still use it. All right, Colossians chapter 1, head that direction. If you're there, say I'm there. Ooh, look at y'all. Okay, so go ahead and stand up to your feet for the reading of the Word of God this morning. We're going to read a few verses here in Colossians 1, starting in verse 15. We got a lot of jerseys in church today. I like it. I like it. All the sports fans. I'm more of a baseball guy, but baseball fans? Have we got some Dodgers fans? That's what I'm talking about. All right, verse 15. Here we go. Colossians 1.15 is about Jesus. Uh, you, you may be familiar with these verses if you've been around church much. Um, if you like these verses or if at some point during these verses you decide you like these verses, you're allowed to be encouraged. You're allowed to say, ooh, that's good and that's for me. We believe church is a participation sport. Amen? Uh, so here we go. Verse 15 is talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. Hmm. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things. Somebody say all. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Are you thankful for Jesus this morning in church? That's what we call the good news. All right, I'm going to pray for us as we dig in today. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for every person in this room right now. Thank you so much for everything they're bringing in, the highs and the lows. We thank you that you know every single one of us. Uh, even though we may not know everybody, you do. And Lord, we do expect you to speak to us through your word. Thank you for your word this morning. Would you open it up to us? I pray that in any place that we are uh, checked out or not hungry, that you would make us hungry in our hearts and in our minds. Anywhere that we are hungry, Lord, I thank you that you promised to fill us. So we are expecting to hear from you today. Leave here different than the way we showed up. It's going to be a good few minutes in church. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take a seat. It's fun to still see all the cute babies in here. 
I forget uh, where I saw this one time. I think it was a comedian or something like that that I was watching uh, one time. But he was making a joke about how you would have to be absolutely insane to want to ever be the, the president of the United States. You know, like you just have to be crazy to want that job. I mean, just think about it for a second. Part of you is like, ooh, I'd be important. But then think about what you got to deal with. So it was funny, and he was making this joke, you know, saying, you know, I wonder what the, the wake-up call for the president is like every morning. It's probably not a phone call, but there's probably a designated White House intern every morning, got to walk in, and this is the wake-up call for the president, it's the intern. Problems. <laughs> Problems. <laughs> Problems. It's like, yeah, that would be terrible <laughs> to wake up like that every day. I, I always thought that was a funny joke. I, always, I, I would think about that randomly. You know those things you think about randomly and you laugh to yourself, by yourself? <laughs> those are kind of the best, even though it's super awkward. That was, that was one of those things for me. I'd think about that periodically. Thank you, God, that I don't have to be the President of the United States waking up like that every day. And then 2020 happened, and now we know. Now we all know what it's like to wake up every morning. Problems. Problems. Pull out your phone. Problems. Get out your computer. Problems. Get a phone call. Problems. Go to work. Problems. Problems. It's problems, right? Problems. Problems. I, I didn't want to know what that's like, but now I know what it's like. And we all kind of laugh because it's kind of funny, but we're sort of laughing to keep from crying a little bit. <laughs> but hey, at least we're all in this together. So for all of us coming to church this morning with at least one problem on your mind, with at least one thing going on in your life. We're just going to start off all being honest together. And let me just hear you say, I have a problem. I, 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 have, I have a problem. Just, just the one. Just the one. <laughs> Over these last few months this year, you know, you and I personally, maybe, maybe we haven't talked that much over the last few months. But I've seen you walk through the door. I feel you, bro. I have a problem. I've seen you walk through the door of church, though, and uh, I've noticed just kind of on the whole, we're walking in with a little bit less pep in our step than we used to. <laughs> Notice that about you sometimes, and, and especially right now, you know, I can only see half of your face or less when I'm up here, but, but I can see the important part that tells me how you're doing every week, and I've noticed up here that it, that, that part of the face is, is looking different this year, this time of year than it did 12 months ago. It's just a little different than it used to be. And actually, I can, I can hear it in the worship. I don't know if you can hear it, but, you know, our soundboard's got a billion little knobs on it and buttons and things. It seems like I think somebody went back to the, the fader labeled desperation and just sort of turned that up a little bit. You can hear it. And uh, it sounds bad, but it's actually beautiful. It sounds a little bit different. You can, you can just hear it. If we're, we're a little more desperate than we used to be. And uh, so I don't know if you've heard this recently from, from anybody, but I just want you to hear it, church. I'm proud of you. Way to go. You made it all the way to October 18th so far. That's, who knew that would be such an accomplishment this year? I, but really, really, I, I am proud of you. I am proud to be a part of this church, and I'm praying for you a lot. So just know somebody is praying for you. And, uh, you know, just however you showed up today, Feeling however you're feeling, thinking whatever you're thinking, going through whatever you're going through, at least you're here. So, you know, give yourself a pat on the back. Because I think this year we gotta, we've, we've been learning how to give ourselves some grace, hopefully. And maybe some things aren't going the way you thought they, were going, you would, they would go. Or maybe the better way to say it is you're not doing some things as well as you think you should be doing them, but at least you're doing them. You realize that, like, it's more true than ever that half or more of the battle is just showing up. <laughs> And you're doing that, and, I, and I'm, I'm proud of you for that. That's a big deal. That's a, that's a big win, and uh, I'm glad that you're here. I'm, I'm proud of you. Jesus loves you today, <laughs> if you haven't heard it yet. Jesus loves you. Jesus is with you. Even with the problem that you have right now, Jesus is with you. Jesus is with you. Problems. 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 Lots of problems. And then we got this election now coming in 16 days. Don't know if you heard about that. Speaking of problems, if you came to church not thinking you had a problem, now you have a problem. Now, I'm paying attention more than before. I've been able to vote for a few, uh, few elections. Um, but I'm paying more attention to this one than I have in the past. So I'm not some expert on, like, 
really much of anything at all, so definitely not elections or stuff, stuff like that. But, but as I'm observing things right now, I, I'm, I'm seeing some things that are, that are really interesting. And I've noticed over the last 12 months, or maybe even longer than that, but just kind of as this election cycle has, has picked up, what I've noticed that's sort of striking to me is not only does it seem like the world is working harder than ever before, the world that I'm living in, the world that I'm living in is working harder than ever before to make sure that I know every day that I have a problem. You know, it's like overtime. Won't let me get through a day without making sure I know I have a problem. The world I'm living in is working hard. It seems like harder than ever. But not only, not only that, but it seems like the world I'm living in is also kind of working overtime to make sure that I know that the church has a problem. Everywhere I turn, lots of conversations. Now, I know I'm a pastor, and so I have church-type conversations, whatever that means. But that's what you think I have, right? <laughs> whatever those are. But it's, seriously, it just seems like those are the, I'm hearing so much about how I personally have a problem and the church has a problem. And, and it seems like as I've been, you know, praying and preparing for our time together, not just this morning, but as in the coming weeks, and specifically these weeks leading up to, to this moment and this election and the things that we're going through and the things that we're all trying to navigate in October 2020, that seems that the world, or the message that the world I'm living in expects me to preach as the pastor of the church is, the church has a problem. That's what, that's what it seems like this, this life wants from me right now. And since I'm the pastor, I'm supposed to stand up here and tell you how we're all going to fix it. We're going to fix all the problems. Here, here's, here's, here's how we're going to fix all the young people leaving church these days. Here's, here's how we're going to fix. We have a problem, and here's how we're going to fix. Post-Christian culture is going to sink the church unless I do something about it. Here's how we're going to fix all those Christians who vote for Trump. Here's how we're going to fix all those Christians voting for Biden. Because that's a problem. All of them. We got to fix them. We're, here's, here's how we're going to fix the liberal agenda that's contaminating the church and the gospel these days. Here's how we're going to fix all these right-wing evangelicals, all crusty and fundamental. Here's how, here's, the church has a problem. And, and pastor, we got to talk about how, how, how we're going to fix it. You're going to fix it. The church has a problem. Problems. Problems, Pastor, problems. But uh, I've been reading my Bible, and I've been praying for you, and I've been hearing just some of the things going on in some of y'all's lives, some of the testimonies of what God's doing, just like scratching the surface on some things. And there's even been some things where like, you know, you, you hear a news story, but then I've been able to just hear random little things about maybe some of the behind the scenes of some of the news stories that on the surface sound all bad, but then you hear a little bit about what God's doing beneath the surface that the news isn't reporting on, and you're like, oh, devil, you shouldn't have let me hear that part. Because, and, and I've even been studying, not just, not just some of our, our history as a nation, but, but our history as Jesus people and as the people of God. I've, I've been studying and learning some things. And, and in the midst of that process, it seems that the message that, that God has been burning into my spirit, the, God, the, the message that, that I believe God wants me to give to, to you and to us over these coming weeks and this season in this moment of time in this 2020 after this quarantine during this pandemic leading up to this election in the middle of the problem that you have this morning, the message that I think God really wants you to hear is not that the church has a problem. I think God wants you to know the church is a problem. And that's what I want to preach to you about this morning. Write that at the top of your notes. The church is a problem. The church is a problem. Now, this morning and, and over the coming weeks, I'm just going to tell you my angle straight up from the beginning so you know. I'm going to talk to you like you're Christians before you're anything else. That's, that's how we're going to talk. We're going to talk. I'm going to talk to you that like before you're American citizens, you are citizens of the kingdom of God. Before you are male or female, you are children of the most high God. Before you are red and yellow, black, brown, and white, you are a chosen race and a royal priesthood. I'm going to talk to you like before you are Republican or Democrat, you are a member of the body of Christ, which is the fullness of him who fills all in all. You've been warned. That's the angle. I'm not just going to be upfront about it. But I'm going to talk to us like we're Christians, okay? Because we're in a wild moment. We are in a crazy time. I have heard so many people this year, all kinds of ages, and I only pay attention to the people who say, who are like a little bit older, who are like, man, I've never seen it like this. You know, you hear like a 22-year-old say that, and he's like, oh. 
not bashing on 22 year olds. I'm 31. It's the same way. I'm like, I've gone to say that sometimes, and I'm like, dude, you haven't seen much of anything. <laughs> but I've heard like old people say it, and you're like, oh, dang. <laughs> this is the worst I've ever seen it. I've never seen us like this. I've never heard it like that. This is the worst it's been since then. I've been hearing that a lot. And this is a wild moment. This is, this is a crazy time. But just because it's our wildest time and our craziest time doesn't mean it's the wildest time and the craziest time. So as we get going, I just want to share a little bit about your history as a Jesus person. So our, our history as the people of God. Because I just want to let you know on the front end, we've been through some stuff before. <laughs> when Jesus decided to be born and live and die and raise again and birth his church, at the moment in time that he decided to do that, in that, in that cultural moment, that cultural moment should have been a huge problem for the church that Jesus was aiming to start. It was a mess. It was a mess. And in, 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 in the location on the earth, it was just a big mess. In the middle of this Roman Empire, corruption everywhere, every level of government, locally, nationally. I mean, it was, it was messed up. And there was you know, immorality just rampant in every sphere of society and only increasing, not decreasing. Things were just getting, people were getting crazier, doing, doing wilder things. And there was racism in every direction. Nobody liked anybody. Everybody hated everybody. You know, just bad news. There's power being leveraged in every possible way by those who had it for their own good, not for the good of anybody who didn't have the power. And all of this power leveraging was resulting in crazy social and economic injustice and inequality all over the place. I mean, it was a, it was a moment. <laughs> there was some stuff going on. But when you look at the story, the problematic empire that was supposed to be a problem for the church, actually served to be an incredible vehicle that catalyzed the church that Jesus came to start. See, this massive, messy empire, one of the things it had done is created a common language over massive parts of land and populations and people. And so not only were people speaking in a common language, pretty much no matter where you went, but somebody had the people had translated the Old Testament scriptures into this language, so now it was in the common language. So people had an understanding of now the God that they were waiting for. And in history, there's this phrase, Pax Romana, that is uh, used for the Roman Empire. It means Roman peace. It's sort of like what the environment was like. But, you know, it sounds good, but if you get into the context, it was like kind of a pseudo peace. It wasn't because, like, everything was fine. It was because, like, if you stepped out of line, you lost something important. <laughs> you know, like... Pick a body part, just, we're just going to cut that one off, you know. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I'll stay in line. And that's what they called peace. So peace, sort of, but peace nonetheless, okay. So that was, that was happening. And what that meant was that in this peaceful environment, sort of fake peace, but still sort of peace, you could travel fairly freely. There was a shared culture in a lot of different places that you went. And that meant that ideas could spread really quickly because the language was the same and you could travel freely in different places. They had paved all of these roads. You know, Romans, they were famous for their roads. Roman road, you know, you know roads everywhere. And they built them for themselves, but that turned out to just become the highway for the gospel to spread around the world. To other towns, to scattered people and cultures. So the political environment was a mess. It was a problem, but still... Jesus managed to do something with it. And not only that, but God's people were a pretty big mess too when he decided to come be born and live and die and resurrect and birth his church. They were, they were divided and uh, we would never know what it's like for the messes to be around like they had, but they kind of had these four sort of categories in the people of God at the time. There was the Sadducees. If you've read your Bible, you've heard that word before. Probably the Sadducees. They were they were kind of like the the members of the temple leadership, basically the religious elite of the day. And the way that they dealt with this cultural moment that they found themselves in, and the conflicts that uh, that they found themselves in with the the political climate and kind of their religious agenda, what they did was they would just make peace with the Roman Empire so that they could benefit from it financially. So they just kind of leveraged it for their own good. 
And then you had the Pharisees. Uh, you've probably heard of them too in your Bible. Uh, they were not so much the elite, but a little bit more common, but, but still in, in charge. But the way that they understood what was happening happening in the moment was that the Roman occupation in the empire was, was God's judgment on Israel for being unfaithful to him. So the solution was to expand the law to force all this faithfulness. So they stressed obedience to the law and, and developed elaborate systems for applying the law, even not just the law of God, but laws they made to every single possible element of life so that they could kind of force Israel to be faithful. Then you had this group uh, called the Essenes or the ascetics. They, they were just like, we're out, bye. Like culture's bad, the body is bad, life is bad, earth is bad, like city's bad, everything. You know what we're going to do? We're going to the desert. We gone. <laughs> I'm sick of dealing with this. God hates it all anyway, so we're out of here. So they just wrote the whole thing off. And then there was the zealots, and they were they were rowdy bunch, and... Uh, really passionate, and they're, they're, they were sort of these revolutionaries. So their response to the moment was like, well, let's just burn it all down. So they would like assassinate people and tear stuff down. That was, that was kind of the route that they thought God was calling them to go. So that's the moment that God shows up in in the flesh. And Jesus walks down the street and says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And everyone's like, yes. Because all four of them thought that meant they were right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But then he says, repent and be baptized. And they're like, what? I thought you were like, they repent? And he's like, all y'all repent. <laughs> and be baptized. And so initially you would think that Jesus, with this whole kingdom of heaven thing, that he was going to have this big team. And all these people are going to get really excited. And they were kind of excited at first until they started listening more. And then they started to reject him really fast when they started to realize that he wasn't as political as they wanted him to be. He wasn't going to do things the way that they wanted them done. That he was actually saying things like, this kingdom of heaven, it's from within you. He would say things like, I'm going to bring the kingdom to earth by dying. That's a quick way to lose followers. He would talk about how he was building a future where uh, the temple wasn't the most important place on the earth. It was actually completely irrelevant. He was building a future and a people where every single person, no matter socioeconomic background, no matter ethnicity, would have equal footing under the grace of God. He claimed to be God. And they all wanted God to come, but not like that. So they did what they did with all kinds of people who rose up and claimed to be the Messiah. Because that would kind of happen a lot. So the solution was kill the person and all their followers would sort of disperse. So that's what they did with Jesus. They kill him, but all of a sudden now his followers are sort of still sticking around. They're kind of a nervous group, you know, kind of a, kind of a nervous bunch. But they're now claiming that he's risen from the grave and they're not really going away. And so they were supposed to disperse, but now there's these small gatherings of these Jesus people, and that's what's kind of happening as you read the beginning of the book of Acts. And it gets to the point where the people in power, not just the Romans, but also the religious leaders of the day, they're trying to get rid of these people. But one of their leaders, he stands up in an assembly like this where they're having a big conversation about what do we do? How do we get rid of this church? You know, how, this, how do we cause problems for these people so they go away? And this guy Gamaliel, a leader of, of the time, this is in Acts chapter 5, he stands up and he says, In this present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan is the undertaking of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. If this is God, these people that you're trying to cause problems for is going to start causing you some problems is what he says. And so, what happened after Jesus' death? This man, Jesus of Nazareth. I'm talking about the historical man, the real man. What happened? He, he was a man like every other man. He died like every other person. But what happened after his death is a little different than your normal guy. And what happened is pretty hard to explain, especially with just, just by using human, me, human means. Seven weeks after Jesus rises from the dead, and ascends, he disappears into the sky. That sounds believable from these people, right? But they're still together. He pours out his spirit on a group of 120 followers locked in a room 
above Jerusalem that they don't want to leave. And all of a sudden they all start speaking in these languages that they've never learned before. And they start heading towards the temple because it's the day of Pentecost. That's what you do. We head towards the temple. And as they're doing this, shouting things and these languages that they never learned, but all of a sudden they know, all these Jews who were gathered from around the empire for this day begin hearing their message in their own language. And they're shouting things like about how today, this very moment on this street, in your hearing right here, right Right now is the fulfillment of the prophecies that you've been waiting for. Like in Joel 2, where God promised he would pour out his spirit on all flesh. This is that time. And they're hearing these, these, these scared people that they were scared 10 minutes ago. But now they're all of a sudden really bold. And they're shouting about how this is the beginning of the messianic age. Because God has taken this man, Jesus, from Nazareth. And he has risen him from the dead and sat him at the right hand of God, the Father. Now everybody do what he said. Repent and be baptized. And they're just in the streets of the city. And 3,000 people, I'm in. They're baptized in a day, and then the Bible goes on, and history tells us that awe came upon every soul. Signs and wonders were being done among them. People were being added to this group that was supposed to go away. People were being added day after day after day after day after day. After day, so they started to get persecuted, but instead of persecution becoming a big problem, it just served as gasoline like on an open fire. And it only began to spread, and it spread around the world, not just around the city. And the spread began to include people, not just from a Jewish background, from, but from every language, tribe, and tongue. All of a sudden, the church was a problem. And the Roman Empire has decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do what we always do. We're going to overpower this problem. So they start persecuting these Jesus people. One of the most famous emperors for his persecution against the Christians was an emperor named Nero really early on. He labeled Christians haters of the human race and blamed natural disasters on them and said basically they were the cause of everything wrong in the world. The Romans themselves, the Roman soldiers themselves who would have to under or, or who would have to do Nero's persecution and do the things that he called for uh, to happen to Christians, they actually are recorded as saying that Nero's treatment of Christians, quote, redefined cruelty to the uttermost. That's how bad it was. And one of the next uh, uh, emperors, his name's Domitian, his his solution was, okay, well, I'm gonna establish an emperor-wide religion. The emperor cult is what it was called, which basically is, I'm not just in charge, I'm God. And if you don't sacrifice to me, I get to kill you. So that'll make them go away. Now I got a question for you, church. If you could have been in Jerusalem on that day, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says they were all together. If you could have been in Jerusalem on that day on the street beneath a room where you had heard there was still 120 kind of weirdo people locking themselves up there saying they're praying because some guy that they were following had just raised from the dead. And this news is so good that they won't leave the room. <laughs> they're too scared to even leave. Imagine you're on the street that day in Jerusalem. Right before the world changing and suddenly of verse 2. You're standing outside on the street, not only are the people locked up in there, but it's day number 10 they've been in that room. And somebody comes up to you and says, all right, I want you to bet all your worth on something. I want you to pick a bet here. On October 18th in the year 2020, in a little place on the opposite side of the world of where we're at this morning called Indianapolis, there's going to be a group of people gathered in a room for some reason. Which one are you going to bet on for why those people are in that room gathered? Would you place everything you're worth on the fact that the reason that those people are getting together is because of the greatest empire the world has ever seen is still around? Or they're gathered because of those cuckoos up in that room up there. Which bet would you have taken? Not only has the church survived, not only did the church survive, despite it being illegal for the first 300 years of its existence, which, side note, is longer than we've even been a country. 
So 300 years is a long time. Not only did the church survive, but it has thrived and multiplied and outlasted the Roman Empire that tried to become such a problem for it. And we're here, obviously, today for that. See, church history, from its birthday on that day of Pentecost to today, October 18th, 2020, in Indianapolis, is the testimony that the church is a problem. The church is a problem. You can put it anywhere in the world. You can fight it with anything in the world. And you can change everything about the world, but you cannot make it go away. That is the testimony and the story of your history as the people of God. You are a problem. And that brings us to Colossians chapter 1, written to a church in a city called Colossae during this time that we've been talking about. Jesus people, just like you, trying to figure out how to live in this moment, how to, how to try to live in these tensions, how to try to live in the midst of all of these problems. They're being tempted specifically by a couple of different things that Colossians addresses. Number one, they're being tempted to simply add Jesus to who and what they worship instead of him being the only one that they worship. And they're being tempted to expand the requirements of what it takes to be saved, of what it takes to be a good Christian. See, people were trying to say that it wasn't enough to just be saved by grace through faith, but they're trying to work in kind of all the old school traditions. And you got to also be circumcised. You got to also do all these uh, religious ceremonial cleansings. We're going to we're gonna add to the list here. We're going to make the box a little bit more strict. And that might sound ancient, and you're kind of like, wow, cool, more church history. But I would suggest that maybe this is more relevant for you and me today than we think it is. See, we're similarly being tempted to have Jesus on one pedestal of our lives, but not the pedestal of our lives. We are tempted to have Jesus be our Savior in church, but to go to the ballot box looking for a Savior too. We are tempted to similarly create our own definition of who the real Jesus followers are the good ones, what it takes to be a good Christian. And we don't draw the lines about circumcision and ceremonial cleansings anymore. No, we're not not crazy like that. We just do it about things like, you voted for who? You didn't post what? There are a lot of real things in our lives right now that really do matter. I have some opinions on some stuff. I have some preferences, I have some thoughts on some things, and there's actually some of those things that I'm personally, like, feel pretty passionate about, like, looking into, and all of that kind of stuff, because, like, I've got problems. You've got problems, we've got problems, our world has problems. But Colossians, this book was written for the church at Colossae, and I believe written for the church at Antioch, Indy, to remind us who we are, to remind you that you may have some problems, but you are a problem for your problems. And you need to be reminded, church. And so I'm going to give you three things that make you a problem. And my goal is that we walk out of this church with holes in the walls because you just walked out kicking stuff. Like, oh, let's go. Because that's how you should feel about being a Christian. That's how you should feel about being a Jesus person. That's how you should feel in the midst of all your problems. Is, yeah, I got problems, but I got news for my problems too. I... I'm a problem. So I got three things for you that make you a problem that, I, that you need to make sure you know about in 2020, October 18th, right here, right now. Number one, our king makes us a problem. Our king makes us a problem. We read verses 15 through 18, or 15 through 20 earlier. About our king, he is the image of the invisible God. He will list off what my king is like. And I'm telling you, church, your king makes you a problem. Makes you a problem for politics. It makes you a problem for politicians. It makes you a problem for political conversations. Because no matter who gets into what power, I still serve the king who created all things, who is above all things, who holds all things together, and who is before all things. Since this election doesn't change my king, this election can't have my peace. Since this election doesn't change my king, this election can't make me hate somebody who disagrees with me. This election can't make me divide from my brothers and sisters just because we voted differently on a person. How ridiculous would that be when I have a king? What does Donald Trump and his agenda, or Joe Biden and his agenda, 
have on Jesus Christ and his agenda. This makes us a problem, church. This makes us a problem for hatred because we're just going to keep loving everybody. This, this makes us a problem for division because we're just going to keep serving everybody. See, as big as this election is, church, it is not bigger than your king. And that makes us a problem for political parties who may try to manipulate us. That makes us a problem for labels that may try to pigeonhole us. That makes us a problem for criticism that may try to control us. We are a problem, church, and we are a problem for the fear that is trying to immobilize us. The fear, oh my gosh. See, since you already have a king, you're free to just vote on a president. For some reason, us Christians are having a heyday trying to freak each other out. Like, you better watch who you vote for because the person you vote for, you are endorsing everything they've ever done, everything they've ever said. You are confessing your loyalty to them in every single way and professing that this is the godliest person in America who will lead us to the glory. Oh, Jesus. I've already got a king for that. And he happens to be the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. All things were made through him, for him, by him, in him, all things hold together, even the rulers, the authorities, the dominions, and the power. He's the head of my body, the church. He's the firstborn from among the dead. How do you do that? I don't know. Talk to my king about it. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether in earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I've already got a king who took care of all of those things. You're free. Just go vote. Stop freaking out on each other. <laughs> Come on. Oh, our king makes us a problem. I'm a, I'm a problem because I've got a king. You've got a king, church. Don or Joe may be the president of the United States, but Jesus is king of the universe, and Jesus is king of my life. Y'all can have the White House. Our hope makes us a problem. Oh, it's second service. I'm about to have fun. I got no reason to end on time. Jared, we're about to be here all week, bro. Oh, Christine's off today, so she can't order lunch for everybody. <sighs> okay, fine. We'll end at some point. Our hope makes us a problem, church. We're going to stick in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Oh, do you know? how big of a problem your hope is? Do you know how big of a problem hope is for depression? Do you know how big of a problem hope is for despair? Do you know how big of a problem hope is for anxiety? How big of a problem hope is for fear, for rage, for hatred? Do you... A big one. Spoiler alert, a big one. See, this little phrase... Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven is loaded for you, church. See, it speaks to the eternal hope that we have in Jesus Christ. It means there is more to the reality that I'm living in than what I see and taste and touch and smell and feel in my little lifetime. See, it means that Jesus was before all things. There was a before me. It means that he's after all things. It's going to be an after me. I am important, but I am also little old me. There is more going on. There is more going on, and Jesus is the king of all of it. And so I may not be able to hope in myself, but I don't have to, because I can hope in my king. I can hope in this eternity of being united with Christ in his kingdom, in glory, for his love is more powerful than death, and his love is stronger than the grave. There is nothing that can separate me from the love of God. I got a hope laid up for me. But well, listen to me closely, church. What makes you and your hope an even bigger problem is that the hope laid up for you in heaven isn't just there for you for when you die. See, heaven here 
doesn't just refer to some disembodied place you get zapped to when you die. Heaven, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, the rule and the reign of Jesus, the reality of God, the power of God, the presence of God, the eternity of God. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about right here, right now, there's a hope laid up for you in the reality of Jesus. Why else would Jesus say, I want you to pray that your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. The hope of, the, of heaven laid up for you, it's not just out there for you. It is in you. You don't just have a hope for when you die. You have a hope for right now as you live. No matter who is or isn't in the White House, no matter what they are or are not doing, church, the king is moving through you. Every situation is an opportunity to see his kingdom. Every situation is an opportunity to show heaven and usher it in to earth. See, you don't have to lose hope because some things go crazy. You need to look forward full of hope because you just showed up. And things are about to get crazy. Our assignment makes us a problem. Our assignment makes us a problem, church. Chapter 1, verse 27 through 29. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Which is Christ the King in you, the hope that you have of glory. Him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I want you to underline verse 28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. He says, Christ, he is the king. He is the hope of glory that is inside of you. And he gives us our assignment here, church. We cannot miss this. This is the one part, if I was going to pick one, that would make me stay here all week. I know we're getting close and the band's coming up. Our assignment, church. Christ the King is in you. He is the hope of glory. But we are, so that means we are not here to proclaim a Savior president with a goal of making everybody agree with me. We are here to proclaim Him. Warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom. What does it say? Not so that we can be right about everything, but so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Oh my gosh. Our assignment, church, in this time, what does God want from you? What does God want from us? What is heaven hoping for in the church in these days, in this time? What is the assignment? The assignment, church, is to be mature in Christ. And that makes us a problem. Because if maturity in Christ is the goal of our lives, then our enemies just become those we love. Any persecutor becomes somebody that we bless. Any disagreement just becomes an opportunity for humility. Any distraction becomes a chance to stay focused. Any fear becomes an invitation to learn to pray. Any disappointment becomes a call to worship. You can put us anywhere. Fight us with anything. You can change everything, but you cannot overrule our king. You cannot take our hope, and you cannot change our assignment. Do you realize what is possible in this room? Look around, like for real, look around. Make make awkward eye contact with somebody, you know? Look around, look around. Look at a few different people. Everybody look around. Look at somebody. Do you have any idea what is packed inside that person? Do you have any idea what's packed inside of you? If there were no other believers in this city but us, in a city of one million, do you realize we could still turn this place upside down with the kingdom of God? 
Do you see it? There's more to the story than the part we're in. Do you have any idea what God could do with you? Do you have any idea what God can do with the time that you do have? The capacity you do have, the choices you can make, the job that you do have, the moments you do have, the influence you do have, the friends you do have. Do you have any, any idea? See, the combination of you and me and the Holy Ghost, that's a problem. That's a problem. So church, I need you to remember in this time, if you are a Christian, you don't just go to church. You are the church. And the church is not perfect. Church is not always pretty. But the church is a problem. I want you to stand as we close our time together this morning. What do you need this morning in order to leave here more confident than the way you showed up? What do you need to let go of in order to leave more free than the way you showed up? What do you need to believe right now to leave more full of faith than the way you showed up? I'm telling you, Jesus did not aim for you to come to church today so you could walk out saying, hmm. He, went, he brought you here this morning to make sure you walk out of here with a pep in your step that maybe you lost a couple months ago. With your chin maybe a little bit higher than it's been in a little while. With your heart more full than it's been full in a little while. Not because the problem went away, but because you've realized you are a problem. You're a problem for your problems. You got a king. You got a hope. You got an assignment. And he's letting you loose on the world that you're living in. We're going to have our prayer team up at the front like we always do. If you need prayer for anything in your life, don't leave without getting it. That would be, that would be silly. We're at church. I mean, it's where you pray. So let's pray for each other. If we're worshiping, let the Holy Spirit in. Fill you this morning. I'm going to pray. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your church. We thank you for this truth. And we invite you now, Holy Spirit, fill us. Fill us. Fill us with power and hope and faith. Fill us with conviction and belief that every single one of us would be different as we leave than the way that we came today. We're asking that this room whether visible or invisible, would be full of things left behind as we walk out with increased confidence by the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name.